everybody. Welcome back to another edition of Crafting and Crime Daily. Today is Wednesday, hump day. This is a show that is designed to give you something to listen to while you're crafting. Today, I put away the diamond painting, got out the crochet. I am making a graph gown out of squares that have gnomes in them. I'm working on the August gnome, which is, let me see if I can find a picture of it. Here it is. Yes, it is the back to school gnome. I'm doing the girl whoop, on the end with the apple. And her, her little cap is designed to be kind of like a pencil. I don't know, we'll see. We'll see if that comes out. So here's what I have so far. And it, it actually goes this way. There's the apple. There's her hair. Kind of cool. So I've started the pencil hat part. Yep. A lot of work. But I think I could do corner to corner in my sleep. So I'm going to finish this up this year, this gnome project. And then next year, I'm going to do another corner to corner wrapkin that's going to be one piece. And it's floral. And it's going to be so cool. Anyway. I digress. So you're not here for that, are you? So you're here to hear the Thomas Randolph case. So this is part three. So let me just recap really quick. Thomas Randolph is uh, a gentleman that lived out in Vegas with his wife, Sharon. Sharon was his sixth wife. Now out of the six wives, he's suspected of murdering three of them. He was actually tried for the murder of wife number two and found guilty. So this is not his first rodeo with a murder trial. He thinks he's a lawyer now. God. Okay. So on this night in May of 2008, him and his wife, Sharon, they just get back from Utah. They had spent a week in Utah visiting his father who had had a stroke. They come back home for Mother's Day weekend. He takes Sharon out for dinner at the Santa Fe Casino. Then he comes home and they interrupt a burglary. She's shot and murdered by the burglar. He confronts the burglar who's wearing a ski mask and he murders the burglar, who turns out to be his friend, handyman friend, that he met and hired. So the police start to suspect. So, and that's a lot of what we're going to get into today. What made the police suspect that this was not what it seemed? Yeah, we're going to talk about that. But first, the first, uh, the, one of the witnesses that took the stand was the neighbor who lived directly across the street. Now that night, I need some coffee. That night. He was outside in his uh, garage working on his vehicle. And he gets a phone call. Simultaneous to that phone call, he sees the neighbors pulling up. And they, he, he sees that the car stops in the driveway, lets out a passenger, and then is proceeding into the garage. So he's on the phone with his friend. And they do put the phone records. And the phone records say that that call came in at 8.33. And it was a four minute phone call. So he said, uh, you know, all of a sudden he started to hear shots, gunshots. Uh, he said he heard three, you know, boom, boom, boom. And he said a pause and he heard another one, boom, and he said a pause. And then there was another one. That was basically it. So he hears these gunshots and it is until 845 that the 911 call comes in from Thomas Randolph. Why the delay? Yeah, 833 to 845. So even if you assume that sometime during this four minute phone call, maybe the, during the last minute was the gunshots, that would put it at 837 and you still don't get a phone, you know, another 911 call from inside that house until 10 minutes later. What is Mr. Randolph doing? I don't know. Okay, so then we have Detective Vaughn who takes the stand, who... <laughs> Interestingly enough, 
he just retired last Thursday. That was his, uh, has nothing to do with his trial. He just, that was his retirement date. So poor guy, <laughs> not even retired a week. He's got to come into court and spend a day and a half on the stand. Very nice looking composed guy. And so he talks about, he's a homicide detective. He was not the, what do they call it? On scene detective. He wasn't in charge of like the crime scene investigation. He was just responded to the, the crime. Actually, what he did was he took uh, Thomas Randolph down to the police station and he conducted an interview of Thomas Randolph. So that interview that is quite lengthy is shown to the jury. And I sat through it. Yeah, I sat through it. It was interesting. Thomas goes through the entire thing and then they stop him. And they ask him questions along the way. Then they turn on the recording. They said, now we're going to record this statement. And they, they, you know, put the recorder on and introduce themselves and say the date and all that good stuff. And then he has to go through the story a second time. So one of the things that came out during this interview was that that day, the day of the murder, Mike, the burglar, handyman, his friend, came over about 3.30 in the afternoon on his bicycle, didn't have a car of his own. When he did have a car, it was probably his uncle, so, which is who he was living with, and he described what that car would look like, but he said most of the time it was a bicycle, and not always the same bicycle. So, we don't know how he got to the burglary that night. Not sure, you know, if they found a bicycle somewhere. But that day, Mike comes over to Thomas's house and they go looking for, looking at jet skis. Now, his intention was to go to the bank and then go to look at the jet skis. And his wife kept rushing him because you know, they had dinner plans that night, you know, hurry up, go, because, you know, we've got plans tonight, and I need you back in time, and he goes to the Kawasaki place, he and Mike Miller, well, first, they were talking, Mike was apparently talking, they were talking in the car on the way, and Mike is telling him a story about his girlfriend, and he completely misses the exit for the bank, so then he decides, okay, I'll just, I'll go another day. So he doesn't go to the bank. They proceed on to the jet ski place and they look at uh, it's the Kawasaki jet ski and they looked at the jet skis and they, uh, Mike looked at a motorcycle. And I, I think it was Thomas's plan to purchase a jet ski. He said he wanted to see if he could do it with his bad back. Like, I got news for you, son. If, if your back is as bad as you say it is, don't get on a jet ski. Well, that's not a problem because they don't have jet skis in prison. Any case. So following this lengthy interview that the jury gets to watch, there's a long discussion and the detective is answering by way of a narrative, which is usually not allowed. And of course, the defense objected you know, he's giving a narrative. You have to respond to a question. There has to be a question and then you give an answer. But in this case, what the prosecutor was looking for is what did he hear? What did you hear during that interview that caused you concern or that you felt was odd? And so he was talking about different things. And so the judge overruled that objection and said, no, he can keep going. You don't have... Because she says, I can interrupt him every couple seconds and say, and then what? And then what? And, you know, what else? No, she says, no, no, just let him go through it. So we're going to go through it. Because there was a whole list of stuff that he felt was really, really odd. And following his testimony, the jury got to ask questions. And they had a really good question. Yeah. So... The jurors did get to hear the 911 call, which is, is, is also lengthy. And it's, it describes how 
he is encouraged several times to go help his wife. In any case, the first thing was his description of how he meets Mike Miller. He said it was four or five months ago, which that's accurate. It was back in February. We're now in May. And he describes how he gets up behind this guy at a convenience store in line. And the guy is, per Mike is purchasing a 40 ounce beer and he's being carted because, but he doesn't have his ID. And the guy's saying, Hey, you know, I come in here every day. I buy the same thing. And every day you try to cart me. And the detective thought this was odd because if you're there every single day and you get carted every single day. And today is the day that you forgot your identification. Don't you think you're going to remember that? Plus, he says, Mike Miller did not look like a 21-year-old. I don't even know how old he was, but he didn't look like a 21-year-old. So he felt like that kind of discussion was suspect. I'm sewing in the ends of the graph can. Then he thought it was odd that you would pick up someone that you just met five minutes before and then drive to their home and said, sit in front of the home and have a one hour conversation. Now this has to do again with Mike Miller after he purchases the beer for Mike Miller because he forgot his identification when he got carded, he forgot it. So he ends up buying him the beer then he goes on his way, and then on his way home, he sees Mike Miller, offers him a ride home, gives him a ride home, and they proceed to have a conversation in front of Mike's house for an hour, how he's going to employ him, and this, that, and the other. I think I'm, am I done here? Yes, I am. Okay. Now, what do I have to do? I have to read the pattern. Now, one of the other things he said during the interview was that his wife wanted him to have more male friends. So I guess this was his opportunity to have a male friend. Why would you choose this guy? Not, uh, I don't know. Then another thing that was odd to the detective was a statement that Randolph made saying that Mike Miller was not the best worker, yet he continued to employ the guy. Well, if he's not working out, why would you, maybe because that's his male friend? I don't know. Then here's a really big one. This is the one I have thought of was odd. You know, they had just been gone for a week and this is his friend, Mike Miller, his employee. They're gone for a week. He doesn't burglarize them then. He knows that they're only home for the weekend and that they're going to leave the next day and go back to Utah to help care for their, his father. Why would you choose the time when they're only out for dinner, a limited amount of time, and risk getting caught? makes no sense. Why wouldn't you just wait till they're out of town again? Also, during this interview, Mr. Randolph said that the defendant didn't have on the same clothes that he had on when he was there earlier that day from 3.30 till whenever they got back from the Kawasaki jet ski place. He was wearing something different that night. So some of the other things that the detective pointed out, he showed in conjunction with some photographs. They showed a lot of photographs of the crime scene. And one of the first things was that, you know, he describes this walkthrough, during this walkthrough, everything that happening in this hallway. There was no evidence that any shooting occurred in this hallway. All the evidence points toward a shooting occurring in the garage. It doesn't point towards Mike Miller being the aggressor. It points towards being Mike Miller being chased into the garage by the defendant and gunned down. Then he says when he was confronted by the guy in the ski mask, Mike Miller, he doesn't know it's Mike Miller, 
and then he chases him into the garage and shoots him. He says, at that point, the only thing he had in his hand was a gun. So, but when we get to the crime scene, the photographs of the garage, there's a bag of, there's a bag of jewelry. I mean, all his booty is in the garage. It just, it doesn't make sense. Then, with respect to the crime scene, he said drawers were pulled out, but nothing in the drawer was like rifled through. Everything in the drawer was the way it's supposed to look in the drawer. And there was nothing on the floor. You know, when you ransack, you know, you're pulling stuff out of the drawer and you're throwing it. He said, didn't, this house did not look ransacked. Then when you saw the jewelry box, he said that it hadn't been disturbed. I mean, there was still some jewelry in there. So the jury gets to ask questions after all this is over. The, the first thing they asked was, did you dust the drawers for fingerprints? And he said, I, I don't know. Because, again, he was not the officer in charge of the crime scene investigation. That's a different officer that we're probably going to hear from next. But the question that I thought was really, really good was, at any time during this lengthy interview down at the police station and during the walkthrough, did he show any emotion? Did he and he's like, no. And that, and I'm seeing the same thing. I, you know, I mean, you've seen the walkthrough. The jury saw the interview. He doesn't, it's, it's almost like he's the star of a movie or something. Like, you know, he's, it's just weird. He doesn't, you know, if I accidentally, or I, even if I did it on purpose, if I purposely killed an intruder, I would still feel horrible for murdering him. Yeah, I'd be emotional. I'd be a wreck. Yeah, I mean, I don't believe this guy's ever killed anyone before. Well, we don't know. <laughs> he may have, <laughs> but the jury doesn't know that. And he doesn't show any emotion towards the loss of his wife. No grief. But I need to say that you know, even the defense lawyers during their opening statement pointed out, told the jury, listen, our client, he's an oddball. He, you know, he, he doesn't, he uses profane language. He's, you know, this is, it's just him. That's the way he is. So are they going to overlook the fact that he was not showing any emotion? I think by the very nature that they asked the question, is kind of telling. They're looking for some kind of, you know, you've just been through this traumatic experience where you had to shoot an intruder who has just shot and killed your wife. And you're talking about it like it's a picnic. Like you're retelling, you know, the Mission Impossible plot. It just doesn't make sense. So that was the testimony that we had for day three to the end of day two and day three. Now, I will tell you, I did not get to the second trial yesterday. I had to mow the lawn. <laughs> yes. And afterwards, being out in the heat, I was, I was wiped out. I felt very nauseous. I had to go lay down. After I took my shower, I went and laid down. Couldn't even get back up because I just was exhausted. But I feel much better today. Yay, refreshed, ready to go. Anyway, back for s'mores. Back for s'mores. Anyway, <laughs> that's a retreat that I went to several years ago. I think that's it for today. I am going to be doing a live tonight at 7 p.m. I have to remember the new time. 7 p.m. Central Time. So that's 8 o'clock for you Eastern folks. And then the other guy, you guys have to figure out the rest. <laughs> because I don't do math. It, that involves subtraction and addition. And I'm just watching the cat. All right, guys. Have a wonderful hump day. Hope it's better for you than my Tuesday was. And I will see you guys either tonight in the live or tomorrow for another episode of the podcast, Crafting and Crime Daily, The Widower. And I'll have an update on the second trial. 
Bye, everybody. Bye.